Less than a century ago, humanity's cosmological picture underwent an unprecedented expansion when the astronomer Edwin Hubble revealed to the world that the Milky Way is far from the only galaxy in existence. It suddenly became apparent that the cosmic horizon spanned unimaginable distances in every direction, and in which our home galaxy, a spiral of some 200 billion stars, was just one in a sea of trillions. In this moment, humans opened their eyes to a new appreciation of the scales and immensities of the cosmos. The last century has been a time of incredible human discovery, and in which the field of cosmology has acquired new scientific status. Among other feats, scientists can now determine the elemental composition of distant stars, and the trajectories of galaxies in relation to our own. They have gained insight into the birth and death of stars and planets, as well as the fabric of space and time. In this new understanding, our universe appears to us as never before, as a developing and evolving system of fantastic forces and energies, and dynamic displays of order and chaos. Perhaps most extraordinarily, small patches of this fabric have become conscious of themselves. We live in a universe that our ancestors never imagined and it is now apparent that making sense of our new cosmological picture requires a departure from old ideas and metaphors, and the exploration of new frames on reality. Our journey begins with the observation that the way we talk about nature can ultimately be scaled to a grounding cosmic metaphor, which itself comes to serve as the lens through which we form our deepest questions about what we are and our place in the universe. The Western scientific lineage can be seen as having moved through two epoch-defining paradigms, as characterised by their grounding cosmic metaphor. These are the view of the universe as a great mind, moving into the view of the universe as a great machine. The long-standing cosmic metaphor of the universe as a great machine has become so closely associated with science that it is often viewed synonymously with it. This is not the case, however, and today the great machine metaphor no longer serves to further our understanding as it once did, and there are now telling signs that the modern mind is in the midst of a transition toward an organismic lens on reality, apprehended as an evolving, self-generating, and ultimately living process. Furthermore, this organismic paradigm may offer greater explanatory and predictive power, as well as a deeper, more meaningful understanding of our place in the universe. Of course, none of this is to say that the universe has not been historically compared to an organism, both in the Western lineage and in many other cultures. We'll return to this point later. To be clear, the purpose of our discussion is not to argue that the universe is an organism. The universe is the universe. The question of whether it is more like an organism than it is like a machine has only a subjective answer. The manner by which we apprehend the universe may reveal more about ourselves as we meet reality in our historical moment than it does about the character of the universe itself. This is, however, not to say that progress in our understanding cannot be acknowledged, and as we will explore, it is growingly apparent that we indeed appear to see further and with greater understanding through an organismic lens than through any other concept available to us. Mind and Machine Understanding the rise of the organismic paradigm requires that we understand some of the historical forces that have shaped the outlook of Western science, 
as well as their resulting influence on the modern mind. The narrative offered in this section is at best an incomplete summary, and at worst a caricature. However, it is necessary for us to weave the essence of this story, albeit crudely, in order to articulate and give contrast to the organismic vision and its implications. In the Western academic lineage, the view of the universe as a great mind was conceived by early Greek philosophers around the 4th century BCE. The view that the world is essentially alive and imbued with spirit has been a perspective of many cultures throughout history. Greek thought had its roots in earlier polytheistic religions, which in turn had their roots in animism. In recognition of an essentially mental ground of reality, Plato forged a worldview recognised by scholars as a form of idealism. For Plato and his contemporaries, the world of form that surrounds us is, in essence, a projection from a transcendent domain of being, more mind-like than classically physical. This was the realm of the ideas, a greater reality from which all manifest phenomena receive their form and essence. Nature had intentionality, meaning that it was purposive, teleological, a drop stone fell to the earth by its innate desire for proximity with the centre of creation. These views, originating largely from Aristotle and Plato, were adapted by early Christian scholars in the Middle Ages who revered the high culture of ancient Greece. The transcendent realm of what Plato called the ideas both informed and was used to justify the Christian idea of heaven. In the Platonic dimension of perfect forms existed the highest transcendent good. As Christian theologians sought to distance themselves from pagan nature religions, they came to perceive a deeper piety in viewing the creative impulse of the universe as entirely outside of this world in the inscrutable intentions of their all-powerful creator. In this sense, the creative impulse of reality became estranged from the world, but for the occurrence of rare instances of divine intervention. For Christians living in this period, all areas of life were to be interpreted in terms of the Christian doctrine. Fundamental questions of death, birth, morality, value, meaning and judgment were to be understood without exception through the authority of Rome. To challenge the church was inconceivable to most, and to do so was to tempt exile, torture or death. The theologians' growing preoccupation with worlds beyond life further heightened their sense that the world within which they currently inhabited was fallen imperfect and separate from God. Though created in his image, to live in and be of this world was to be corrupted by sin, fated to endure the terrible sufferings of the flesh. Admittance into heaven had become a near impossible feat of piety and asceticism, and the unspeakable horrors of the alternative hung like a shadow over medieval Christian life. In the 17th century, the ideas of philosopher René Descartes played a significant role in shaping what science would one day become. Among his influential contributions, Descartes brought to light the distinct characters of mind and matter, identifying them as the two primary ingredients of reality. Descartes' ontological distinction between the mental and the physical eventually came to serve as a boundary, marking the territories of the church and the new science then emerging. The mental would remain the province of spirit and the divine order, leaving the remaining crude matter of the world available for scientific interrogation. Within this delicate truce, Scientists now enjoyed a relative freedom to 
consider bold new questions and ideas. It wasn't long, however, before their reported discoveries appeared to pose conspicuous challenges to the truth claims of scripture. Despite this, many of the thinkers comprising the scientific revolution in Europe were Christian in outlook. The father of the machine metaphor of the universe, Isaac Newton, conceived of the great machinery of the universe as first set in motion by God, who upon creating the world stands back and attends its progress. We can only speculate about what Newton really thought, but if you'd asked him, he would have told you that he was a Christian, and that behind the machinery of nature resides an all-powerful God. And yet, as the decades and then centuries passed, the sheer power and efficiency of the mechanistic model led scientists and philosophers to increasingly regard such supernatural forces as obsolete and superfluous. Reality was, in essence, material. As the machine metaphor rose to prominence, all phenomena, including the mental, were viewed as reducible to mere matter. While there were several notable countercurrents, such as the rise of German idealism in the late 18th and early 19th century, the scientific revolution of the early modern period, with its mechanistic, materialist philosophy, portrayed an inert and essentially meaningless world, devoid of consciousness, value, purposes or meaning. Even the revered rational human mind was, in the final analysis, an illusion, a mirage of complex biological processes. By the mid-19th century, the ideas of Charles Darwin had set the intellectual community alight, as he and others brought into view the radical idea that all life has a common ancestor, with a simple molecular origin. Undermining the Christian creation story, in this view, the human is no more than a relatively intelligent animal, privileged only by its adaptive capabilities to an unsympathetic and changing environment. Evolution bears upon nothing more transcendent than the physical transference of genetic material from one generation to the next. And in their apparent compliance with deterministic mathematical laws, the processes of life seemed aptly framed within the mechanistic paradigm. Animals and plants were machines, as were humans, and ultimately, so too was the universe, the outworking of inert, immutable, and purposeless natural laws. And while the self became an ever more peripheral bystander on the cosmic stage, the mechanistic view continued to justify itself, as associated with extraordinary advancements in anatomy, medicine, cosmology and technology, as well as providing a rational stability to the worldview of secular culture. The shift in consciousness initiated by the rise of science can be framed through what is sometimes termed the Copernican Revolution. When humanity learned that it was not the physical center of the universe, this discovery challenged not only sacred scripture, but also our sense that we, or life, holds any significance on the cosmic stage. The Copernican Revolution describes an intellectual movement in which scientists and philosophers vowed to themselves never again to be deluded into notions of human significance. The consolation was a sense of empowerment and release from the stifling moral dogma of the church. Scientific knowledge was a power that could be wielded over nature, and with it we could transform the world to serve our own ends. Instead of its victims, we could be masters over nature. We could build our own heaven here on earth. This was a view championed by the English philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon, and captured in his famous aphorism, knowledge is power. 
Many contemporary thinkers observe that the mechanistic materialist frame has deeply shaped the worldview and values of the modern mind. While science and its mechanistic materialist understanding liberated the modern mind from the oppressive doctrine of the church, the new frame emerging from the scientific revolution, while amazing and humbling in its reach and power, profoundly decentralized the human mind, its meanings, values and goals. Several contemporary scholars have argued that apprehension of this reality, apparently devoid of mind and meaning, has contributed to a shared sense of isolation, meaninglessness and separation from nature, from other beings and from the larger universe. But does the machine metaphor of the universe really provide the most accurate appraisal of the true nature of things? Is reductive materialism the only rationally defensible interpretation of our scientific discoveries? As we will now explore, in a little over a century, the machine metaphor has faced a series of unexpected and unprecedented challenges which have led to the empowering of an alternative perspective that given the same empirical scientific evidence, a more powerful and explanatory metaphor for our universe is that of an organism. A greater reality. In the early 20th century, while working by day as a patent clerk, the physicist Albert Einstein began developing a theory which would eventually convince the academic world that space and time are not fundamental features of reality, as had long been assumed, but are in fact generated out of a deeper underlying order. The universe is not simply a place or a container in which things happen, it is rather a developing system. During the same period, the emerging field of quantum mechanics went on to describe a deeply interconnected reality, within which no single part could be truly abstracted from the whole, and in which every particle is potentially interconnected with every other particle in the universe. Through Einstein's discovery that light travels at an astonishing though finite speed, we realized that our most distant observations reveal the universe at its most ancient. The light from distant galaxies captured them as they had existed when the light was first emitted, billions of years ago. As we gazed out into the vast cosmos, we realized that we are in fact also gazing through time. Both Einstein's relativity and the emerging physics of the quantum came as a surprise to then senior physicists of the early 20th century, many of whom believed that physics was approaching completion as an exhaustive description of nature. And yet coming discoveries of the next 100 years would begin to intimate a much deeper and more mysterious reality. For the early scientific forerunners, such as Kepler and Newton, the Earth, Sun, Moon and planets comprised the entire universe. Few took seriously the possibility that the stars, those mysterious points of light moving together across the night sky, could in fact be other suns. The most sophisticated cosmology was primarily concerned with modeling the predictable movements of the observable celestial bodies. Theories were demonstrated through the literal use of clockwork models, with pirouetting planets encircling first a central Earth, and then later amended to a central Sun. Earlier models of the universe were attempts to grasp an apparently timeless reality, in which the celestial bodies moved eternally and unchanging. Today, however, cosmologists understand themselves as inhabiting a very different universe, a universe which has undergone a long developmental evolution prior to arriving at its current state. And while Newton's classical physics 
of a deterministic, causal matrix remains highly practical for many purposes. Its grounding machine metaphor hardly seems to fit our understanding of the developing universe. Nor does it correspond with our deepest observations of it. The new cosmological picture is decidedly evolutionary. Understanding how the universe came to assume its current state is no longer a matter of explaining a timeless order, but a developmental story, within which the greatest climax of novelty and complexity is unmistakably the emergence of life and mind. Life and Consciousness Is there life beyond Earth? There are now believed to be 20 billion or so Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy. Places where the primordial conditions that were necessary for life on Earth may exist. Interestingly, there is evidence of single-celled life on Earth virtually as soon as the right conditions were present. It's not clear if this is a sign that life is common throughout the universe, but if that is the case, it's also true that single-celled life existed for an exceedingly long time, billions of years before the first multicellular organisms emerged. There's a very long and uncertain road between single-celled slimes and relatively intelligent life such as us. But of course, the universe is also a fantastically large place. Keep in mind that while our galaxy could contain these 20 billion Earth-like planets, it is just one galaxy among trillions. Nobody can truly grasp these numbers, but it seems implausible, though not impossible, that intelligent life is so fantastically rare that it only happened once. This seems out of keeping with the rest of what we know about cosmological phenomena. But whether or not conscious life has arisen billions of times, or just once, its presence on the cosmic stage is revealing of a reality capable of supporting its existence. Subtle enough, deep enough, to carry value, meaning and significance. With consciousness comes the very possibility of significance itself. It is an extraordinary fact about reality that it supports the existence of consciousness. The mechanistic view, with its materialist philosophy, neither predicts nor has an explanation for consciousness. The possibility of subjective experience discloses a depth to reality that the outwardly viewing mechanistic paradigm cannot meaningfully articulate. By the latter decades of the 20th century, philosophical materialism had lost significant stock in both the science and philosophy of mind. The materialist view did not seem capable of incorporating the extraordinary fact that certain arrangements of matter are subjects of conscious experience. This became known as the hard problem of consciousness. The philosopher David Chalmers, who famously coined this term, offered a radical alternative to the ailing mechanistic materialist approach to explaining consciousness. Chalmers emphasized an assertion previously attributed to René Descartes three centuries earlier, that consciousness possesses an undeniable and immediate reality which cannot be doubted. Descartes' famous, I think therefore I am, is today updated to, I have consciousness, therefore I exist. For Chalmers and a growing number of philosophers and scientists, the irreducible reality of consciousness must be preserved in any account of the universe that aspires to completeness. What is vitally missing from our understanding of brains, argues Chalmers, may also be missing from our basic description of the world. Discussion in this area 
often centers on the so-called intrinsic nature of reality, which has long been a mystery in science. We simply do not know, as the physicist Stephen Hawking once put it, what it is that breathes fire into the equations of physics and gives reality to the world. So what does this have to do with consciousness? In recent times, a constellation of philosophers have argued that the exclusively outward-facing description of the world provided by physics both implies and requires an interior landscape, an intrinsic ground to which the equations of physics point. Developing on ideas first put forward by Bertrand Russell and Arthur Eddington in the early 20th century, a new generation of philosophers and scientists argue that the intrinsic nature of matter may also be the essential nature of consciousness. As the philosopher Thomas Nagel has put it, quote, we ourselves are large-scale complex instances of something both objectively physical from outside and subjectively mental from inside. Perhaps the basis of this identity pervades the world." End quote. Far from there being no space for consciousness at the foundations of reality, for these thinkers, physics seems to require something very much like consciousness in order to be complete. Recent years have seen a new flowering of such thinking, which in the philosophical literature is known as panpsychism. But whether or not panpsychism is true, it is an example of an alternative frame on the same scientifically revealed universe. While the mechanistic materialist paradigm has been the default lens of science, it is now becoming recognized as containing underlying and often unexamined assumptions about reality, and other plausible metaphysical frames, including panpsychism, exist to be explored. One thing is certain, the universe is unmistakably a very different place due to its supporting the existence of consciousness. And while the last 300 years of empirical science has systematically factored out subjective experience, truly confronting the reality of consciousness unavoidably reframes our cosmological picture and should inform our considerations about the basic character of the universe. We will return to consciousness, but for now, let's move on to intelligence. Intelligence. The relative intelligibility of the universe by human minds has been viewed as a deep mystery by scientists, including Einstein. Our brains evolved to much of their current cognitive capacities when we lived as hunter-gatherers. And yet it turns out that such brains are also capable of understanding highly abstract concepts in mathematics and theoretical physics. How humans acquired their capacities for abstract and rational thought is a matter of ongoing debate. It has certainly not been bestowed upon all sentient life. We should of course acknowledge the significant displays of intelligence in other species, notably in other primates, as well as dogs, birds, octopuses, dolphins, and whales. Intelligence, like consciousness, is a striking feature of life the existence of which may in fact hold wider implications to cosmology. In recent years, several scholars have considered that the ongoing evolution of intelligence could actually play a role in the long-term development of the universe. As the Princeton physicist Freeman Dyson has written, quote, it is conceivable that life may have a larger role to play than we have yet imagined. Life may succeed against all of the odds in moulding the universe to its own purposes, and the design of the inanimate universe may not be as detached from the potentialities of life and intelligence as scientists of the 20th century have tended to suppose." End quote. In a similar vein, the futurist and inventor Raymond Kurzweil 
known for his predictions about the coming technological singularity, has argued that today's cosmologists largely underappreciate the fantastic potential of life, and specifically intelligence, to eventually shape the entire universe. Quote, Intelligence is very powerful. It is the most powerful force that we are aware of. Intelligence can overcome supposed natural limits, not through any kind of magic, but just by figuring ways to manipulate forces at finer and finer scales, so that ultimately, what seem to be natural limits can be superseded. It won't take us that long for us to do this at a solar system scale, and then a galaxy-wide scale. Ultimately, we will turn the universe into a large mind that is trillions of trillions of times greater than all of human intelligence today." End quote. Perhaps a pervasive cosmic intelligence developing over billions of years will eventually redirect the course of the universe's development, perhaps even prevailing over the apparent inevitabilities of entropy. Of course, nobody knows what possibilities might one day be realised on the cosmic stage, but it would certainly be unwise to rule out the greater potentialities that exist for consciousness and intelligence, and neither should we dismiss them in our considerations of the basic character of the universe. The Cosmic Ensemble The more we know about the universe, the more it becomes relevant to ask, why are things the way they are? Could, for example, the strength of gravity have been different? Could the speed of light have been faster or slower? What, if anything, constrains these apparent constants of nature? In the 20th century, physicists and cosmologists recognised and then turned their attention to this question. Their findings, however, sparked controversy throughout the field. The values that governed cosmic evolution were indeed extraordinarily precise. In many cases, the tiniest alteration to these values produced dramatically different universes, the overwhelming majority of which being entirely inhospitable to either life or complexity of any conceivable kind. Cosmologists calculated that the chances of such a life-friendly universe as ours occurring as a result of chance was many trillions to one. For some, the solution to this enigma is to suppose the existence of trillions of universes, a multiverse within which every intelligible arrangement of nature's values is borne out. For its proponents, this is a mere extension of the Darwinian selection principle, but applied to the universe itself. Within a multiverse of trillions of universes, it's not surprising that we discover ourselves in one that could have supported our existence, no matter how tiny the odds. And yet other prominent voices in the scientific community have criticised this ad hoc and apparently inelegant solution. We're reminded that other universes, let alone trillions of them, only became the subject of serious consideration after the discovery of apparent fine-tuning. In the multiverse view, the true explanation and cause of the universe originates from outside of itself, in the transcendent multiverse and its mysterious universe-generating mechanism, of which empirical evidence of any kind may, in all likelihood, be forever impossible to acquire. Provable or not, the multiverse theory may in fact be the most accurate description of our cosmic situation. Yet it remains possible that the multiverse is not the reason why the universe appears so finely tuned to support complex, conscious life. A contingency of scientists, sceptical of the multiverse theory, have focused on explanations of the universe which do not appeal to a transcendent, unknowable exterior. This, however, has led them to reconsider the apparent fine-tuning of nature's constants, including the possibility that life had to evolve. 
several physicists and philosophers, including John Wheeler, Paul Davies, Freeman Dyson, Andre Lind, Philip Goff, and Thomas Nagel, have argued that we should not rule out that the mysterious and striking phenomena of life and consciousness are somehow necessary, value-giving features of reality that ultimately contribute in some still mysterious way to the metaphysical integrity of existence itself. Keep in mind that any notion of value is unintelligible in a universe without mind, and several contemporary philosophers have argued that it is not unreasonable to consider that some primordial notion of value is required to explain the universe's existence. Perhaps as speculated by the physicist Paul Davies, a truly self-consistent account of the universe necessitates that it be self-explanatory, and as such, produce beings capable of explaining it. In view of the apparently observer-driven character of quantum physics, the decorated physicist John Wheeler tentatively offered that the quote, self-excited circuit of reality involves minds, quote, giving meaning to the world. Developing on Wheeler's ideas, Davies has further suggested that over trillions of years, life and mind will eventually saturate the entire universe permitting it finally to achieve a kind of metaphysical closure in becoming, as Davies puts it, completely self-known. Quote, There's really nothing in principle that I can see that would limit the spread of life and mind right across the cosmos. And so that conjures up the alternative image of a universe in the very far future, saturated with mind. If the universe is about realizing its own mental potential in some way, if it's going to end up, in effect, a mental as well as a physical phenomenon, that completely changes the character of things. We wouldn't view the universe the same way again." End quote. The speculations that we've explored in this section are likely to remain as such, and in some cases may be entirely unverifiable and so technically unscientific. And yet the important point, and the reason it is necessary to acknowledge these alternative possibilities, is that contrary to the proclamations of mechanistic scientism, it is far too early to dismiss the possibility that mind holds some ontological significance, and may even play a role in the long-term evolution of the universe. Our discussion about the organismic paradigm does not rest on the truth of these speculations, and yet it is important to keep in mind that there exists a wider range of cosmological possibilities than mechanistic materialism can acknowledge. As Freeman Dyson has put it, quote, the architecture of the universe is consistent with the hypothesis that mind plays an essential role in its functioning, end quote. organism. We begin with a quote from the 18th century philosopher David Hume. Quote, the world plainly resembles more an animal or a vegetable than it does a watch or a knitting loom. And does not a plant or an animal, which springs from vegetation and generation, bear a stronger resemblance to the world than does any artificial machine which arises from reason? and design." End quote. The organism is the archetypal metaphor of all deeply interconnected and interrelated systems. It is firstly a holistic entity, a system within which all constitutive entities exist in meaningful relationship with all other entities. The entities comprising an organism carry nested self-similarity and fractal properties, which is to say that observation at multiple scales reveals information about the larger self-organizing system. Through discoveries of the past century, physicists and cosmologists today observe 
deeply holistic, even holographic aspects of nature's fundamental organisation, which are distinctly reminiscent of the holistic, self-generative properties of organisms. Machines, on the other hand, are generally not self-organising systems. Their structure is based on goals which exist outside of them, in the minds of their creators. To the modern mind, the notion of a designer god, who sets the machinery of the universe in motion, seems naive. As scientists and philosophers have come to regard the existence of such a god as superfluous to their explanations of nature, the machine metaphor has also come to lack its justifying designing authority. In this sense, the machine metaphor of the universe is broken, incomplete, even in itself. The universe instead seems to develop much more like an organism, moving through developmental stages of organisation and engaged in its own iterative and self-creating process. And while any full account of an organism will include an exterior world which shapes its adaptive functions, the universe might equally be viewed as creating its own developmental environment. Today's scientists have assigned specific behavioural attributes to organisms, which while very useful in a range of contexts, can make a direct comparison with the universe more difficult. Yet if our interest is in a more archetypal view of the organism, profound insights come within reach. A primary attribute of an organism is its being alive. But what exactly does it mean to be alive? Especially from the mechanistic, materialist perspective, the machinery of the organism is ultimately constituted from the same inert processes of matter and at no stage acquires any new property of being alive. The mechanistic frame therefore cannot see into the essential meaning of being alive, even at the level of familiar biological organisms. A contemporary scientist, versed in physics, biology and computer science, might describe life in terms of flows of information through biochemical algorithms. What is lost in this explanation, however, is any sensitivity to the imminent dimension of value which exists for the organism. This dimension of value is invisible to the materialist approach for the same reason that consciousness is. It simply cannot be described in purely behavioural or mechanistic terms. It is nonetheless undeniably present and must be included in any meaningfully complete account of an organism. Whatever physical or behavioural characteristics we reach for in defining life, be they energy metabolism, information processing or reproduction, I would argue that our understanding of the universe, for it to be in proper apprehension of its self-generating, unfolding and creative dimensions necessarily invokes this property of aliveness, if alive is to mean anything. The organismic frame subsumes the explanatory power of the machine primarily because there exists a mechanistic level of explanation of organisms. But while the organism contains these aspects, it is not exhausted by them. The archetypal organism evokes both the physical and mental poles of reality, of a real and existing physical nature associated with a real and existing dimension of consciousness, of value, meaning and significance. To be clear, a shift to a more organismic lens does not immediately transport us into a solution to the ancient mind-body problem. But while the mind's relationship with matter remains mysterious, mind becomes a known quantity 
to be included and formalized as opposed to explained away. Cosmic Identity Many in the scientific establishment retain an ardent skepticism to any notion of possible human significance. In many ways, science can be seen to have produced a trail of discoveries which challenge humanity's beliefs about their importance or centrality in God's universe. As it happens, humans are not the centre of existence, occupying a very small and peripheral place on the cosmic stage. And yet while this is undoubtedly the case, physical centrality is firstly quite a naive criteria for significance. Secondly, and more importantly, we are more than humans. Deeper and more essential than our identity as humans is our identity as minds, as creative, conscious beings with aesthetic sensitivities and relative yet scalable intelligence. As biological organisms, we are, in certain respects, the most complex and novel phenomena known to exist in the universe, and so are therefore, within various dimensions, the greatest known expressions of reality's latent potentials. In these ways, we and other life are a potential source of deep insight into the basic character of the universe. Similarly, in our subjective dimensions, our minds are a glimpse into the vast psychic depths of potential experience and the unfathomable value that awaits to be realized in consciousness. Growing recognition of the significance of consciousness may provide the counterpoint to the decentering narrative of the Copernican revolution. In our most primary identity, we are, as the cosmologist Carl Sagan once famously remarked, a way for the cosmos to know itself. This has always been a perspective worth aspiring to, and yet there is a distinct and consequential difference between the view of ourselves as illusory experiencing fragments in a meaningless mechanistic environment, and viewing ourselves as experiencing on behalf of an evolving system. The cosmology of organism, instead of diminishing the human and its inner dimensions, encourages us to recognize our own mental landscape as an extension of the ongoing creative activity of the universe. It has now become relatively common knowledge that the elements in our bodies were forged in ancient stars. But the 20th century revelation that we are stardust is moving into the 21st century realization that we are the universe. As conscious expressions of this unfolding reality, our identity shifts from an illusory nowhere to, in a sense, everywhere and every being. The philosopher Daniel Kolek has termed such broader conceptions of identity open individualism, and in its consideration of the experience of all conscious beings in all times and in all places, many consider open individualism to be the basis of a truly rational and post-human ethics. While a discussion about the broader meaning of open individualism would take us beyond the scope of our discussion, the organismic paradigm is decidedly open individualistic, because within it we share in a single meaningful identity, and in which our fundamental relationship with other entities is one of cooperation rather than competition. The mechanistic paradigm, on the other hand, more embodies what Kolak terms empty or closed individualism, in which value is unregistered and the emphasis on identity is in its isolated and temporary nature. In the organismic frame, 
Our identity moves from that of a single finite human to an expression of a developing principle of consciousness being variously expressed in the world. Our scientific journey of knowledge becomes reframed as the exploration of valued states of consciousness and understanding and as an experiencing aspect of this unfolding reality, the ongoing journey of knowledge becomes a journey of self-knowledge. Scientific Animism There is a clear resemblance between the organismic perspective and the ancient worldview of animism, of a living world populated with myriad spirits and intelligences. Today's biologists no longer believe in a mysterious life force which surges through living matter. The main reason for this is that their models do not require it. But while the organismic paradigm might aptly be viewed as a form of scientific animism, it is not because we have finally discovered a vital energy which flows through living cells it is because our developing understanding of nature brings ever more clearly into view the profound unity of reality, the evolutionary and developmental nature of the universe, the extraordinary possibility space of life's future, and the ocean of explorable states of mind. In a deeply mysterious way, the universe is the source of its own existence. The manifest living reality of the world, what the equations of physics actually point to, while a complete mystery from the materialist paradigm, connects deeply with the archetypal organism, with its self-realizing and self-regulating functions. Moving to a more organismic frame, does not require us to adopt an exotic new metaphysics. It does, however, invoke a more receptive sensitivity to the open metaphysical questions which are undeniably raised by the striking phenomena of life, consciousness, and the existence of the universe itself. In some ways, the move away from a mechanistic view is to realize that it was even there in the first place, along with its distinct idiosyncratic assumptions about reality, many of which no longer seem justified. Recall that machines are things that humans understand. They are entirely built out of our concepts. As a cosmological lens, it infers that we already understand the world in principle. The entire toolset of concepts is already in hand. A mechanistic frame therefore tends to a naive scientism, dogmatic, hostile to anomalies, and in conspicuous ways akin to the stifling church authority that was once science's oppressor. A machine is a human-made artifact found nowhere in nature but in our own creation. The move to a more organismic lens is therefore a move away from a profound anthropomorphism toward a more naturalistic perspective, capable of greater explanatory power, deeper aesthetic meaning, and a more unitive and integrated worldview. Through the organismic lens, modern cosmology offers the beginnings of an intelligible yet extraordinary creation story which honors rather than diminishes the inner and spiritual dimensions within us. We are no longer isolated fragments of a dead world. We are conscious participators in the ongoing evolution of a deep and vital cosmos, in which we rediscover ourselves in a universe which is once again alive and a part of us.